Survival is a privilege which entails obligations. I am forever asking myself, what can I do for those who have not survived? The answer I have found for myself, and which need not necessarily be the answer for every survivor, is I want to be their mouthpiece. I want to keep their memory alive to make sure the dead live on in that memory. My name is Hala Wartsky, Baborn Kaufman, K-A-U-F-M-A-N. It's like double a end, double. double end, that's right. He says double end, <laughs> K-U-F-M-A-N-N. And that was sort of German name. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and that's, I, and I was uh, from Hungary, Ungwar, that, that, uh, that's where I came from. Okay. My name is Heinz Wartsky, and I was born in uh, Danzig, actually, essentially Germany. We were living, this town, Ungwar, was a, a lovely town near the Carpathian Mountain, beautiful place. But I was going to school, and uh, you know, nobody, uh, was no problem there. We had no problem until the last, uh, I think it was when the when the Nazis occupied, yeah. they came around and they uh, told us certain things we had to do. They made us put yellow stars on on my uh, on my uh, dress, and uh, we couldn't talk to the. Uh, that then they started saying we can't go back to school anymore. That's how it really began. Well, for myself, I think it was uh, very early on when the Nazis came to power, essentially, in Germany. That was in 1933. In uh, January 1933, they, they were quick to separate us from the rest of society, you know. Mm -hmm. As far as that goes, so that was 33. I was four years old, and so it was. I grew up essentially with that, uh, that separation yeah. in existence. One of the uh, points that uh, is very clear, uh, because many things happened that time, it was what is called Kristallnacht, which meant the night of the broken glass. That's when the Nazis uh, broke into Jewish stores, the front, they broke the glass in Jewish homes and so forth. They did, they did that. So that was a, uh, it happened in November, early part of November 1938. And they also, at that time, they arrested many Jews and sent them to concentration camps. Included in that was my father. He was arrested and uh, sent to his concentration camp. Well, I, you know, um, when, the, 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 when they occupied our town, uh, Ungwar, <coughs> they, um, we were not allowed to go to school anymore. One day they just came and told us we have to, they're going to take us away. And we ended up in a, uh, in a factory yard that had a tent. And that's where we were in that tent. A couple of, couple of weeks, I, no, it was, no, it was, I don't remember exactly how long, but we were there and uh, before going to the, to the, the railroad station there and with the boxcars and, and all. We waited, more and more people they brought into the stand. And so then, then, then when they had enough, they, they took us away. Uh, we walked, you know, we walked to the railroad, to the boxcars. 30 feet long by eight feet wide. These were the standard dimensions for a boxcar used to transport countless victims to their death. The atrocious living conditions were endured for days on end. Each car packed 100 or more people, with no room to sit or lay down, uncertain of their final destination.
The re-education of citizens through hard labor was common practice throughout the war. Millions toiled against their will to improve the very war machine that enslaved them. Whether working in factories or exposed to the elements, each human struggled to survive another day, laboring at gunpoint. Now, six months later, this in May 1939, still before the war, uh, he came home and he's, uh, he knew he learned a lesson. And he said, well, you know, these people are going to kill us. They, we know what they're going to do. Again, this is a contrast to what they didn't have that education, okay? So we had all this education. In addition to, uh, they were, the Nazis uh, in Germany were singing all sorts of songs about how they're going to uh, kill us, you know. With, they're going to sharpen their long knives, you know, and it's pretty <laughs> gory th type of uh, uh, activities that they were going to uh, practice. But anyway, so we had... It was more, it was piling up, you know, this, no, maybe, you know, it's going to happen. Maybe, uh, this is what uh, they're going to do. So, and so anyway, he said, we're going to have to leave Germany. We have to get out of here and try to find a place to go to the country. Now, there was a problem. We had, they, in the meantime, they had an enacted number of anti-Jewish laws. They called them the Nuremberg laws, okay, and that's what uh, they, into that, it, under which the Jews, if they left Germany, they could not take any th possessions or any monies with them, very, very few clothing, pieces of clothing, very little, you know, one, one uh, little suitcase per person, you know, maybe a medium-sized suitcase, whatever. Anyway, so that's essential. Now, the problem was, what country would allow people to come in who are destitute? They, each country, most countries, had enough destitute people of their own. They didn't need us yeah. to, be, to come in and be a burden on the, on the society. So essentially, that was, the, that was the problem. Now, how on earth can you, can you get out if nobody will let you in? So my father was thinking about it and said, okay, why don't we do this? And maybe we went to many, many uh, or, um, delegations, foreign delegations. A, one of the delegations he went to was Italian delegations. And he found out that Italians were not anti-Semitic at all. They, although Mussolini was allied with Hitler, uh, the Ital Italians did not practice anti-Semitism. So he, said, he thought, well, why don't we do this here and do this in two steps. We uh, find, get some false papers to some country or whatever, whatever it is, and South America or what have you, and then get a transit visa through Italy because at that time the war had already started and no overseas it, uh, tra uh, transit was going on between Germany and South America or any of the rest of the world. So that's why we could use uh, Italy as a, a, a transit going through. So that was not a hard thing to do to get a transit visa as long as they, they know that you're not going to stay there. But anyway, so we managed to buy some pay, false papers, good papers actually, falsified with our names. At that time you had to do, the falsification had to be very good because the Nazis were not dumb. That's one thing, they knew how to examine papers. So anyway, at that time, most play people, most countries knew how to examine paper. Now it's different. The light was often described as blinding as the heavy wooden doors were slung open. Sunlight or spotlight, the unending wave of victims seemed to never cease. Huddled in a dark train for days, prisoners arriving at Auschwitz were plied with promises of food and shelter. The horrific sorting began immediately after deparkation, as Jews were organized by gender and physical fitness. 
Families were separated, not knowing that for many, this would be their final moment together. Well, what you do is, but before we even uh, got into our uh, barrack, you know, mm -hmm. they strip, they make you take off your clothes. I was stark naked. They shaved my head. After they shaved it, they made us go in under the shower. And that's how, uh, you know, I, and I got a uniform. Mm -hmm. and, they, and I put the uniform on. And I went into the barracks. And this guy sat at a table. He was also a uh, concentration camp uh, um, inmate. inmate. Yeah, yeah. And he said to me, sit over here. And he had kind of an ink, uh, ink, uh, a, a pen, you know. He dipped into the ink, this pen, and he started putting numbers on my hand, you see. And there it was, 21760. Oh, I had this. And every time he, he put the needle in there, you know, I started pulling back. Yeah. Damn it, it hurts so, you know? Mm -hmm. So the A, which is supposed to be Auschwitz, never came up because I just couldn't, st but slowly, slowly, I, you know, mm -hmm. they put that number uh, on my hand. Inside the barrack, there were, there were these, these bunks, three-tier bunks. And my older sister said, let's take the top. They won't see us that way, you know. And, and sure enough, I listened to my older sister mm -hmm. because she knew what she was talking about. And we went up to the, uh, after I, they, he put the number, they, I went up to the, we went up, all three of us. But my older sister said, do not. Tell them that we are related. Do not tell them anything. We are together. But remember, you have a, I have always such a big mouth, I always <laughs> talk, you know. So, but I listened to my sister when she said, don't say anything that you are, re, that you are sisters mm -hmm. or that you are twins or anything like that, yeah. you know, because they're going to, Separate you for sure, so for six months, nobody knew. Joining nearly 200,000 Italian resistance fighters, the Wartsky family struggled to survive in a hostile environment each day. By 1944, one-third of the German army stationed in Italy were fighting a guerrilla war against partisans and refugees that had banded together. At that time, we were, uh, let me see you now, we came out down from the mountains because we were attacked a few times, so we were, uh, came out of the mountains, some of us anyway, and we were running around. The reason we got out of the mountains was because this was an area of a farming area, you know, where we were not too far from the mountains, uh, between the Apennines and the Adriatic. In the central Italy, that's uh, all farming areas. And so the reason we... Uh, I, we wanted to get out of the mountains too because we needed food, okay? And so the farmers, they gave us food. They were very nice to us. The reason they were nice is that many of their sons and relatives were also in the mountains with us in order to avoid being sent to Germany to work. There was a they sent a lot of uh, people from all over Europe. The Germans all occupied areas. They sent people to Germany to work for, because they had, a, they had a scarcity of labor. And so some of the Italian young people were rounded up 
to to fight to and to conscript it by the f- new fascist regime. It was it called a new fascist regime? The old fascist regime <laughs> was fell fell and uh, was uh, overthrown by you know. And so the new fascist regime was uh, then established. And so they avoided doing that also. They didn't want to fight for Germany. They mistrusted each other. We were benefiting from this relationship. Or, you know, we as refugees from, from the, running from the German occupiers uh, and avoiding being to be sent in a, to a concentration camp. Because it's the first thing they did whenever they occupied a country, they would round up the Jews. That was their first mission. And then the first thing they would do, send us to a German concentration camp. And, and that was very even more difficult than for the Hungarians to be sent uh, to a concentration camp in, in, in like Auschwitz. The Hungarian Jews, they understood Yiddish uh, they, because they were under the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. They were allied with Austria. So, I mean, I don't know if you, uh, whatever you I want understood. to us. Yeah, no, you, you want, yeah, you, you guys understood German. Oh, yeah. So that's why they, they understood when orders were shouted to them and they were, could act accordingly. Every day, same thing. They marched us out, and they counted us. Where the heck are we going, for heaven's sakes? Mm-hmm. All these cables and all these wires around us. You couldn't go anywhere anyway. But they still then marched us in, and the, this guy came and brought us some black coffee with a piece of black bread. That was our breakfast for lunch. I don't know, what, what a damn soup, I think, and same thing for, for supper, it was a what a damn kind of soup, you know. And that's how it went. For six months, in, back again, counting us, it was just unreal, you know, it was so... But I said to my, and I was the youngest, and I said to my sisters, I'm going to survive this, I will. I will, because I want to tell what they doing to us. And for six months, that's how we, we, we were. We were waiting because uh, evidently they needed people to work in a slave labor. And so they wanted us, you know, mm-hmm. waiting to see if uh, we, would, uh, we, we had to go, you know. Yeah. And that's how we were for six months. So then one day, in came these SS, they were SS, Nazis. They had the Hackenkreuz right there on their lapel, you know, so you know that they were SS. And they counted, uh, they counted 50 girls. We were so quiet, we were hoping they're going to they did. They count my sister and myself and the 50 girls. They marched us out, and the truck was there waiting for us. Mm-hmm. We didn't know what happened, where they're going to take us, or what's going to happen. But the truck was all covered. You know, it was an open truck, but they covered it, so we wouldn't, wouldn't, we wouldn't know mm-hmm. where we're going. So, you know, my sisters and I said, oh, God, maybe they're taking us and they're going to kill us. Yeah. And before, before, after a while, you know, uh, uh, my older sister said to me, I think we are out of Auschwitz because it was quite a, a, a ways, you know, and it wasn't so smelling the, because the, the, the gas chambers and the crematorium, the, 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 the smell was so unbelievable, you know, from the 
bodies and whatnot. Yeah, but that's how we ended out of Auschwitz. And two days, we were, we were on the train for two days. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and they, they still, we still got the same coffee with a piece yeah. of bread and uh, yeah. water down soup and all that. But two days later, we uh, ended up in another, in another railroad uh, yard. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, but this was a, a station, a, a train, you know, that. Yeah. So we, we were very happy to see, you know, and yeah. <laughs> there was there was out of no more Auschwitz, so so that was uh, really something to to when they opened the door, we went into the yard, and uh, it, 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 they were factories that um, they uh, uh, well the, the the what do you call it the the rooms weren't as bad because this time the we barracks. the barracks right wasn't that bad because we had each individual beds, oh, uh, bunks, yeah. think of it. Mm -hmm. We had bunks to, to move around and yeah. to turn around and all that. So we felt that it was a concentration camp, sure, and it had cable and wires and there were guards, guards still there, but it was different. That we, I could, we could tell it was yeah because there was a, a concentration camp for people who worked there. Mm -hmm. And that's how we, uh, we ended up working in a, uh, in a weaving factory. They had looms and, uh, and, and it had, uh, and it had these, these nice, uh, they showed us how to use it. These were German people that lived in Czechoslovakia. Freudenthal, Czechoslovakia, because they they lived there. They they had their own place and everything, but they showed us how to use the uh, machines. the machines, you know. And we learned. Believe me, we learned <laughs> something. We knew that we we're gonna do it, but at least we had a job. We were doing something, and that's uh, how it happened. That was another six months. The food wasn't any better, believe yeah. me. Not much better. But at least we no longer had to be afraid so much, you know. Then one day uh, we were working on the on the weaving machines. In walked these handsome young men. <laughs> they were British prisoners of war. They also got shot down, you know, when they were yeah. bombing uh, the, the places. And they walked in and we just thought, my God, <laughs> we are looking at them, you know. They did have the uniform on, mm -hmm. you know. And one of the girls knew a little bit, so she said, these are British prisoners of war, they're flyers. Oh, we couldn't talk to them. We weren't allowed. Mm -hmm. We were not to go near them. But they, so, we was, they used to get the Red Cross packages. They were allowed. See, the Nazis al allowed them to have the Red Cross packages. Yeah. So when they came in, they put things in our base baskets, you know, a little bit of, little bit of toothpaste just to oh. brush the teeth, a little bit of chocolate. Uh, Whatever, you know, they, yeah. it was such a wonderful feeling, you know, to see them. And, and that's, that's how it went for another six months. Six months later, here I, we were still working, you know, and the, they used to come and get us. And we were in the factory of, uh, working on the machines. Then one morning, we were waiting for these guys to come and get us. Nobody did. There were no, nobody, nobody, nobody came. And my sister, she was my older sister, I loved her so. She said, well, nobody's coming, let's go see, let's go to the, let's go into the yard and see what's happening. And uh, 
we, we went into the yard. There were no more Nazis, no, no, no guards, nothing. But from quite a ways did I say I, <laughs> I watched. <laughs> I saw. I saw soldiers coming towards us, you know, towards our, our camp. As they came closer, again, this girl, she knew so well. She said, you know, I think these are, these are Russian, Russian soldiers. They look, they look, they had the Russian uniform on. And I, and I, I said, my God, what are they doing here? They, they really came into our, our uh, yard they liberated us. They came and they really, they looked at us, you know. By then, you know, my hair did grow back a little. Yeah. So I wasn't that bad. I, I looked pretty damn good. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, um, and I looked at them, you know, and they looked at, at me. You know, I was already 16 then, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and he picked me up. He picked me up and his tears were his tears were streaming down his face, and he, and he hugged me, and, and oh gosh, they didn't speak any, any Hungarian, yeah. so, you know, but we still understood what they, what they meant, mm -hmm. you know, what they were, or who they were, you know. And they, uh, they truly liberated us. I felt very, very good to be able to finally be liberated, you know. No, nobody can explain the feeling you get, you know, when you don't have to, you don't have to worry anymore. You don't have to, that somebody may come by and smack you or hit you and, oh my goodness. I'm going to survive this. And I did. <laughs>